Blessed be God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Saying Gloria, Glory, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and piety. Grant us fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Those reading is from us. Last for those who are easy and for those who feel secure and want to send out. Alas, for those who lie among beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the sea. We sing our own songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of justice. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revel greed of the loungers shall pass away. Word of the Lord. Thank you. Psalm 146. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Not the the rulers, nor any child of earth, for there, there is no God in them. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. How do they have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God? Who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed, and food to those who are hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord gives the stranger. He sustains the broken and the widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The second reading is from Timothy. Of course, there is great gain in our witness to bond with contempt. For we brought nothing into the world that we should take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pain. And as for you, men have gone, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and for which you made good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who puts life in all things in Jesus Christ, who in his testimony for all conscious Bible made the good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which you will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed, the only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, from whom no one has ever seen or 
can see. To him is honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, demand them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They ought to be good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus shoring up for themselves the treasure, the good foundation for the future, so that they take hold of the life that really is life. Lord, Lord. The third reading is from Luke. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. So Fletcher and I have talked about a couple different things, and one of the things that he has provided me with is when he is not here, um, the Episcopal Church has a website uh, with other sermons from different priests throughout the di throughout not just the diocese but throughout the Episcopal Church uh, worldwide. So the Sundays that Fletcher is not here, uh, I will be picking the sermon of the week, if you will, from the website and reading that in church. So today's is from Jocelyn Schaefer. We have all heard that love, is the, love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. While it is certainly true, the maxim alone may leave us feeling judged, helpless, or defensive. Thank goodness that isn't the only thing Paul said about wealth as he coached Timothy about how to pastor com communities with wealthy folk in them. He says that rich folk are to, quote, do good, to be rich in good works, generous, and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that is really life. You see, Paul knows, as Jesus knew, as the psalmist knew, as Amos knew, as God knows, that wealth can be a particularly heavy and intransigent stumbling block when it comes to living wholeheartedly, living the abundant life Jesus offers, living the life that is really life. Too much money can easily get in our way. In fairness, too little money also poses its own temptations, but that's a topic for another time. Traditionally, for better and worse, more people in our particular denomination of Jesus followers have wrestled with the temptations and blind spots that come with having too much money rather than too little. Whether through euphemisms like we have heard at the beginning of the sermon, or prophetic censures from Jeremiah or Amos or Hosea, or poetic exhortations as we hear in the Psalms like, the Lord cares for the stranger, he sustains the orphan and the widow but frustrates the way of the wicked, or the familiar folktale Jesus turns into a parable in the gospel reading. The plain sense message of today's scripture is clear. You cannot serve God and wealth. As Jesus says, 
before launching into the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Our God, who is faithful and just, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, doesn't work through coercion, shaming, or fear-mongering. The Lord knows those methods may produce short-term change. However, in the long run, they generate deep resistance to the freedom and joy and the life that is really life that Jesus offers. Coercion, shaming, and fear work against Jesus' invitation to transformation, to repentance, to changing our hearts and minds. So instead of seeing these readings as a big warning to those of us who are rich, replete with the threat of eternal damnation, as some have interpreted Jesus' parable, Perhaps the Spirit invites us to receive the fullness of God's grace, as our colleague says, so that we may become partakers of God's heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe the tragedy of the rich man is less about him burning in Hades and more about the way he had constructed his life to be cut off from reality, from feeling compassion in the face of suffering, from the joy of sharing what we have, from the satisfaction of being able to see dignity and even beauty in the faces of those whom we might intrinsically turn away from seeing, like a man with a dog licking his open sores. Jesus is retelling a classic folktale of his era. We think it originated in Egypt and was told among Gentiles of Luke's audience. And then he uses a classic storytelling technique about an imaginary future to provoke a change in his listeners. Think here of a modern story, A Christmas Carol. Dickens used the same technique, right? A Christmas Carol isn't about the reality of ghosts. It's about the possibility of a stubborn, closed-in, old man's conversion to a generosity and joy. After his conversion, Scrooge says, men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But the courses be departed from, the ends will change. The rich man lives behind a wall with a gate. We know very little about him, but that he dresses sharply and feasts sumptuously every day. Did he dine alone? The rich man, who is ironically nameless, knew Lazarus by name but didn't help him. Did the rich man develop a sort of callous over his soul so that the plight of Lazarus would no longer affect him? Did he no longer see Lazarus at the gate? Maybe most of us have a little of the rich man in us. After all, we're often glued to our screens, staring at social media or our bank balances or strings of texts related to our family's emotional trauma. All of that buffers us from noticing and behaving, being available to what actually is. Charles Taylor, the Catholic philosopher respected both within the academy and the church, coined the term the buffered self. Taylor contrasts the buffered self with the poorest self person who is open to the transcendent, to being encountered by reality that may be surprising, uncomfortable, and of course beyond our ability to control. With the buffered self, the Holy Spirit works overtime to get our attention, to pull us out of ourselves. But, thank God, the Spirit does finally poke holes in our defenses. We might call those conversion process. They are often painful, and it can feel like you're going through hell, or even Hades for that matter. But it's only through the puncture of the buffers, the breaching of the walls, the opening of the gates, that mercy flows. So to stay with the imagery of the parable, while his death and confinement in Hades might have poked a few holes in the rich man's buffer, I suspect that the chasm between him and Lazarus will remain until he can see the full humanity of Lazarus until the scope of his concern for others' well-being extends beyond his kith and kin. But you know, while his brothers may be so buffered that they won't be able to say yes to repentance, to the fullness of God's grace, to the opening themselves to the miracle of something rising from the dead, hope abounds. Because that chasm that separates the rich man and Lazarus and Hades is bridged by the one who spans the chasm between heaven and hell, Jesus. Of course, Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, to the last and the lost, like Lazarus. And he came to set the captive free, like the rich man captive to his wealth, likely lost and lonely, unable to engage reality. Friends, 
Jesus invites us through his teaching to let our guards down, to keep our gates unlocked, our ears unplugged, our eyes wide open, so that our souls may become less buffered and more porous to the flow of the Spirit's generosity. Amen. Amen. We now say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, to God from true God, begotten not made, the one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He descended into the heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of people are just uh, all of you to listen and, and respond, either silently or aloud, with anything that you wish to add to these prayers. This is why this is Christ's commandment to love one another as he loved us, with contrite spirits and respect for all humanity, let us pray to God that we may learn to care not only for our brothers and sisters, but for all God's creation, shown forth in the wonder of nature that maintains our common life. Have compassion on all those who suffer from trials and pain, especially the victims of natural disasters caused by our own grief and negligence. Grant them their needed relief and help us with your <coughs> with your children in their current struggles. For us to love the whole creation. I, I might add myself that uh, Puerto Rico is still struggling to recover from the horrible Hurricane Fiona, which not only caused damage to Puerto Rico, but even extended its fury as far north as Nova Scotia and, and Prince Edward Island and Labrador. And there's another hurricane brewing in the Caribbean right now that's expected to hit uh, Florida on uh, about Wednesday in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, uh, Ian, let's pray for the well-being of, of people in the face of these hurricanes and, and that uh, the damage is at least possible and the preparations for the repairs get made as quickly as possible. Kindle the hearts of the leaders of our of, of your church, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Carly, our bishop, and Fletcher, our resident priest, and all other ministers, reveal in them the example of your Christ, who revered and cared for the fullness of your creation. Inspire us to love the whole of creation.
inspire all civil authorities to dedicate their resources and efforts to the building of a better world for your people. May they govern with respect and balance towards nature and through policies that seek to <laughs> to slow, reverse the environmental emergency that surrounds us and threatens many throughout the world. Inspire us to love the whole of creation. Have mercy on your children, suffering from sickness, or body, mind, body, mind or spirit. Grant to all who suffer healing and comfort from their afflictions. Equip us to serve all who are sick as we would serve Christ. Inspire us to love the whole of creation. Bring to your glorious presence all of those faithful who have departed this world in the faith of Jesus Christ. Grant them eternal rest and in the company of the Virgin Mary, apostles, martyrs, and all your saints. Receive the prayers we now offer as a sign of your immense, of our immense gratitude for the many blessings you have given us, and above all, for the life and nature that continues to flourish despite our thoughtlessness. Grant that we may return your love in acts of charity and compassion toward the world that you created and all of its creatures. Creator of all, whose Son came to reconcile all creation to you, inspire in us a reverence for your creatures in this world and accept the prayers that we offer. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, in your compassion to forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live to serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please give your neighbors a sign of peace. Peace, peace. Peace, everybody. Please be seated for the announcements. So, good news, Sunday school resumes this Sunday. I'm looking at Kiki to see if she rang the doorbell. Okay, good. So, if they're down there, they'll be up shortly. Um, like we've talked about before, during the season of creation, we're featuring several readings. Uh, this week's is, our planet is burning, people are hurting, with the most vulnerable suffering the most, the United Nations Secretary General warned world leaders in the meeting at the UN last Tuesday for a report on his speech. There is a link in the email that went out during the week. And like Don touched upon, uh, just like five, just five years after Hurricane Maria caused such devastation in Puerto Rico, the people there are now faced with Hurricane Fiona. I asked. Episcopalians and other people of goodwill to pray for Bishop Rafael Morales and the clergy and laity of the Episcopal Diocese of Puerto Rico as they stand with their fellow Puerto Ricans. President Bishop Michael Curry said, please pray also for Bishop Moises and the clergy and laity of the Episcopal Diocese of the Dominican Republic and for all those impacted by this horrendous storm. And I thank God for the Episcopal relief and development and their efficient response to this crisis. On slightly happier news, we will be having a coffee hour afterwards outside. We hope to see you all there. Um, one of the other things that is important to know, uh, I know this has come up a couple of times throughout the week. When you have a reading and you're like, oh, I've got a, I'm thinking of Kiki, not you specifically, just in general. Uh, and you have a reading during the week and you're like, oh, I have a reading this week. Let me go check out the bulletin. And you click on the link and you go to the website, and it's like Wednesday, Thursday, and you're looking at it, and you're like, this is last week's bulletin, what's going on? Well, to get the bulletin out every week on the website, there is a human being behind doing that. And I mention it because 
The human being that's responsible for doing it now has an even tinier human being that she's responsible for, and that tiny human being isn't always on schedule. So if you do click on the link, you go to look, you see what's going on, and the bulletin's not there, um, remember my most favorite piece of advice, don't panic. It'll be there. You can always look at the Episcopal Church website. That always has the most up-to-date readings. I promise by Sunday morning the bulletin will be there, um, and we'll be fine. Uh, birthdays. We have another birthday this week. If you thought the Allens liked to stack birthdays, you're right, because this week it's Hannah's birthday. as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. During a lay-led service, we skip through most of the great thanksgiving, and we now jump to the Lord's Prayer. So, and now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God, the source of all that is, with joy we have offered thanksgiving for your love in creation, and have shared in the bread and the wine of your kingdom. By your grace, plant within us a reverence for all that you give us, and make us generous and wise stewards of the good things we enjoy. Amen. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 